All right, welcome back. Um, so we have a good group. Uh, we didn't scare too many off from uh, last week or uh, last week, last Tuesday, this is past Tuesday on uh, the getting started with Fusion. Um, today, we're gonna continue on with Fusion and uh, continue with our ShopBot training today. Um, what we're gonna work on today is learn a little bit about the assemblies and components uh, within uh, Fusion. So continuing with the project that we have from last Tuesday or this past Tuesday is this uh, game that's called Shoot the Boom. So we worked on creating the sketch and the 3D component for this bottom section here. We're going to uh, do a brief over, over uh, view of what a component is and um, how, it's, uh, how it's made. So before we get started in creating this assembly, I'm gonna just do a real quick overview of what's uh, going on over here on the left side. This button here is our data pane that allows us to view all the different projects that we have. The project folder I have called mine. So we'll learn more about this in like the coming weeks on why you might want to organize things in the way that I have. Um, but inside here, I have a couple project folders. Now one is uh, the one that I've already completed, the Shoot the Moon, which is this complete assembly here. I could open this up and see the entire components that make up this assembly. I'm going to back out and uh, just quickly take a look at what we have uh, right here. Um, so this was a uh, very first basic sketch of what I did to create uh, the game. So clicking the home button here, we have this project right out front that's called uh, Shoot the Moon. So I really have three separate projects going on within this uh, data or th within my organization on the, uh, the left side here. So this first one, is all of the components created in one file, one model. Um, so we see we have the base, then we have the foot section, which is down here, and then we have the head section. This is one way to create a three-dimensional model or three-dimensional um, assembly of the product where all of the components are in one job or organized in one one location. I'm not crazy about doing it this way, um, mainly because I now cannot use this component, which is listed right here, in another model or in another assembly without breaking it out, without making a copy of what is in this assembly, making a copy of this and bringing it out. Now those two items are what has now become they call unlinked. Uh, so if I make a change to this part, the copied part is not going to be changed. So um, just want to mention that we have components within a main project, or we could have separate products or separate components, as I've completed here, that make up one complete assembly model. And this is the way that I prefer. Um, you might have your own uh, reasonings. Uh, I might do a little uh, session uh, next week on why I would do one versus the other. Uh, neither way is wrong. Um, it, it's what you're more comfortable with or what you might be or how you might be using the, the assembly uh, for your end project. But anyway, uh, we're going to uh, get started. Um, again, left side is our data pane. Um, we could show and hide that here. Then we have our application bar that is across the top here. And then we have tabs. Each tab uh, is representing a open model or open component or an open project. So I'm going to close this project here, and I, I don't need to save it, and uh, we're going to work on recreating this assembly uh, that we have here. Um, as we just looking at this, we have a couple 
icons or a couple shaded areas here. These are showing uh, joints. Uh, if you're coming from the uh, you know, SolidWorks or Inventor, they would call these constraints. So we have um, one, two, three, four different constraints uh, here. So there is a different types of constraints that are used. There's rigid, uh, slider, um, you know, revolve. Uh, so I have a rigid joint, which means that it cannot move at all. It's kind of locked in place. Then we have a, a, a pivot um, constraint that is uh, constrained to the center of our circles here. And we could just use that to rotate those around. So to create and start off creating this assembly, I'm going to click the plus sign that is up on our tab, which is creating a new file. Uh, the new file can, can, can contain the sketches like we started this past Tuesday. Uh, but in this case, I'm not going to draw anything. We're just using this sketch or this uh, file to make our assemblies of the drawings that we've already completed. So with this opened up, I'm going to click to show the data pane. And I'm going to start with uh, just bringing in the base into our model. So again, we could rotate this around orbit, holding the shift key the, and the center mouse wheel, then pan without holding the shift key down and the center mouse wheel pressing the center mouse wheel. So to insert the base, and this is the file that we worked on on Tuesday, I'm just going to bring that over as a drag and drop onto our model. Now when this uh, comes in, I'm going to get a warning that I can't do this because I have not saved the project yet. So the first thing we'll do is click here, and I'm just going to call this main2 and select the folder that I would want to have this in. All right, so now we have a file main that now allows me to drag created models over. I just saved it in the right folder. So um, mine, shoot the moon. Let's just do this again. File save. So the message that I got uh, when I brought that over from a different project is we, we want to keep our models linked. So if I make a change separately outside of what I'm going to be working on here in this assembly, that everything uh, stays together. So uh, bringing that uh, now back in here is a linked model. Um, and the first thing it does when it brought in is brought in, it gives us the option to move and locate this part in the world space here anywhere we want. I don't typically worry about where it's brought in because we're going to reorient and um, set this uh, using our uh, joints and constraints. So I'm just going to select OK. And one thing to mention and look at is we have this button here that says uh, this chain link here. That means that this model was not created within this folder here. It was created outside of our uh, model, which is linked to this section right here. So with that in here, um, it is possible to still kind of move this around within our space. The next thing I want to do is bring in a, another component that is drawn separately. That is the foot section 
down here. So again, just gonna drag that over and bring it into place. Again, moving it around really doesn't matter. I'm just gonna kind of move it to an area that is uh, a little easier to maybe see both areas where I have to join and mate this face to this face down here. So with that done, say okay. With the, the difficulty, uh, I think, with uh, coming into fusion is uh, understanding the different ways and methods that is, uh, that is used. Typically, if uh, you have coming from SolidWorks or Inventor, the constraints or the mates that happen here usually take um, two to three faces uh, to lock into place and to fully constrain the model. Fusion does it in a slightly different way. Um, and it's, uh, it actually works uh, once you get used to how it is uh, used. Um, but they managed to be able to do it with one constraint or one join uh, or one joint is what they call it. So the joints are found inside the assembly tab. And it is this button right here uh, that is for a joint. So the idea here is we are going to select a area of the face that matches up to another area of another face. So we'll see how this happens. We'll see this a few times as we link other parts together. And coming in and clicking joint. Now what this is saying is I have moved these parts around from when they are originally imported. I'm going to say yes, uh, capture this position because then they are not going to go back to their original uh, places. I am going to have to undo uh, what I'm going to show here um, and we'll, we'll see why. Hopefully you'll understand why. So what I want to do is this face, when you hover your mouse over top of uh, a face, we get a lot of little arrows in spots that we're able to snap to. And we want to think about those areas of how do they match up to the face or our mating surfaces. So we want to select kind of the same spots on both. Uh, so an easy one right now would be this spot right here, this area here, and um, is going to match up with this area right there. And we have to look at the orientation of the way that little circle uh, arrow is being placed. So it kind of looks almost the same, but you see that one's slightly angled. That one is uh, flat and parallel to the, this surface. Uh, I could rotate it around and get that spot there. Those are different areas are of different surfaces. So if we selected this, this option right here, that is the same as the spot that is right there. So knowing which one we click on to make to our other surface is uh, kind of a critical uh, spot to, to figure out. And as you move around, it's sometimes tricky uh, to have it like stay snapped to that area. If you hold the control down, it is locks you into that face. So as you see, I'm like moving that mouse around and trying to snap it to the end there. It won't do that because I'm holding the control down. Now, if I release the control, then it allows that to be snapped uh, at anywhere I want. So again, I'm going to hold the control down and snap to that position right there. Now, once I've selected that point, this goes to a, a, a ghosted image, uh, meaning that that is selected and it highlights the area that we are going to be mating this to. And now I'm gonna come over to the section that we want to have that set to, which again, holding the control down and clicking that. Well, there it is. Um, it's sort of mated. Uh, we could see how it did kind of come over and hit that point. Uh, but it doesn't really know uh, what angle or where we want. Uh, in this case, I know that it does need to be 90 degrees.
from that location. So I'm just going to change the angle down here to 90. And we see that that pops in, uh, in the right direction. So that is a rigid joint, uh, meaning that it cannot move. It is 100% uh, locked in to its location. The reason why it did move there is I'm still in the functions to be able to create offsets um, in, in the file to be able to relocate that joint based on uh, where I would like it to be. Uh, we have different options for motion. We're going to see this when we add our slider bars in here. Uh, but right now we have the rigid and we will be using the uh, revolve. Uh, this is uh, you know, a slider. Uh, we might take a look at some of those a little bit later. Um, a cylinder that is able to rotate like, you know, say a, uh, a locomotive uh, train uh, wheels, how they're linked together uh, there. So we're using a rigid. Rigid means that it is not a movable part. These two parts are rigidly attached uh, by some sort of mechanical fastener and are not intended to be moved. So once we have that part in the place that we would like it, let's click OK. And now that part locks in place. Now, I didn't have to undo this. And um, sometimes it is uh, tricky on what moves where. So when we selected to have this move and it joined with this, you know, sometimes this part ends up getting moved to orient itself with uh, the other part. And you get this um, kind of skewed up model that is at you know very odd angles and uh, not necessarily exactly where you want it. So I'm going to undo this uh, joint uh, command here by doing Control Z. And you can see that it's again able to be moved around. I want to be able to lock this part and that component in place. Um, Fusion calls it grounding. So if you right click on the component that we want to ground, so we could see we have the base and it kind of goes to that shaded gray, and then we have the foot. The base is what I do not ever want to move when we're constraining and joining all of our components together. So I'm going to right click and select ground. Yes, I'm going to ground it at my new position. We know that that is a grounded component. Get a little thumbtack here. And we also have in our kind of timeline down below that shows the order of things that are happening here. Um, so this is our importing of that, inserting of a model. That is inserting another model. This is some moves that we've done. And that is our grounding. We have this same timeline in individual sketches and individual parts as well. And we'll look at those. So now with that um, part grounded, I am certain that this part will never move and it's going to stay in place. Now with that one grounded, when we go to select the joint, that part becomes the ghosted part. And that is because it is not going to allow us to select that part as our first part to select. So we have to come over and select the face of the part that we want to move. We're going to do just what we did before, holding the control key down to snap to that point right there. Once I select that, we can see that part goes to the ghosted lines and our main component becomes visible. I'm going to hold the shift key down to rotate the part around to be able to select that area there. So again, it is uh, brought over. It is not at the right angle, but we could fix that by creating the angle change to 90 degrees, and then we'll say OK. And now with that part grounded as well, I cannot drag and move any of these parts around. It stays in place. So now to create the other component or import the other component, which is the 
head side. Just gonna drag and drop over. And it is brought in. So I can move it out of the way. That's, we're gonna relocate it. That really doesn't matter. So we'll say okay to bring that in. So going the same exact method, doing a joint that goes ghosted to the same areas that we did on the other one. So from that point, that section is the same. So again, it rotates around. Um, we could fix that by this time setting to zero, but not zero, because that is uh, completely the opposite direction. So let's see what happens when we go 180. There we go. So that is now locked in place as a rigid uh, component joint. And we can see that cannot be moved. Kind of rotating around. The next thing we're going to look at is how to create the um, the rod that goes in between uh, these points here. Um, before we do that, I'm going to take a look at uh, sketching out to get a review of uh, sketching from what we did on Tuesday and see how we could link all of these together um, through just through through a sketch. So I have two options here. Um, one, I, I don't like the option, so I'll, I'll point it out, but I'm not going to do it that way. So I can right click here and select to do a new component, and that will create another tree, uh, you know, or a branch in our project tree here of our new component. That new component is what we were then able to sketch to create our 3D model from. I'm not going to go that route. I'm just going to come over here to click the new design. And I will create a new component in this design. Why? Because Fusion says that this is the number one rule to always make a component. Um, and it just helps keep things better organized. Uh, so if there is any chance that uh, later you do end up building components within the one model, uh, they are here. Uh, cases where I might put two components within one model is if the product that I am designing and making is a maybe a single part that has been welded as one uh, to where um, it is made up of two parts, but they are welded together that become one. So that case, in that scenario, I might use two components within one uh, file. So with the new component brought in here, just going to write, kind of do a double click here, and I'm going to call that rod two, because uh, we already have uh, a rod one, or just a plain rod there. Get a little asterisk saying the changes has been made, but it's not been saved. So we're going to click save in the same folder. Rod two and save. So don't get confused by what I typed in here. This is the component name that is inside of our file tree. The main component or the main file is listed up here, which this, what is listed here, is going to match what is our file name. So with our rod two selected, I'm going to come in and do a sketch. Going to do a sketch from the top side. And sorry for that pause there. I had to think about how this part was really being organized. And I think about sketching in the way that they're going to cut. So I always like to have and design my parts to the orientation or the initial orientation that they're going to be cut. Um, so 
So hopefully we'll see what I mean by that. Uh, so we are looking down at the top view uh, here and um, rotate this around. And line it up more, not that it really matters. Uh, I just like to have, you know, X going across the width and Y going above the height of the screen. Now within this project, we are and have created a sketch and I'm going to just sketch out a line uh, that is going to match the shape of the rod that we're creating. I'm actually just going to do that section right there and then use an offset And we're going to offset to a distance of quarter of an inch. And we get this dimension automatically put in uh, by Fusion. Uh, that dimension is locked uh, to everything here. So if I wanted to, you know, later say a quarter inch was not enough, we could just Click here and say now a half of an inch, and we can see that that automatically has been adjusted to that half inch. Bring that back down to a quarter and just completing our lines and using the automatic snapping from endpoint to endpoint. With that done, it's time to start constraining and locking this in place. So notice that all of our outlined uh, sketch, those lines are blue. Blue is indicating that they are uh, really not constrained, uh, that we can move this part around in different uh, components, you know, anywhere we need and just it's, it's not constrained in any way. Um, so we need to start constraining this and uh, locking it into our dimensions. So to set the dimensions, the first thing we need to do is figure out the height difference from this point uh, to this point, which is going back to our model here. Let's go to our one that we newly created one. So the distance from this point to this point is one and a half. And then over here, this point to this point is two, is two and a half. So there's a one inch difference in height between this two. So coming back over to our rod section and coming under create. Now, one thing I do quite a bit is um, when creating assemblies from components, the data pane tends to stay open more often, but by having that open, we've shortened the number of icons that could be listed here. So by closing this, the dimension tool becomes part of more of a visible toolbox. Just because the data pane is open doesn't mean we can't still get there. We just have to use the drop down and come down to the bottom and click dimension. But for ease and making things a little bit faster and selecting, I like to have that open there. So I am going to mention from this point to this point is going to be one inch. The next dimension that we need to set is basically the point from this point to this point, uh, or here to here. But I don't know what that is yet, so I just threw a dimension in there. Uh, go back over to our main sketch and use the inspect tool. And I want to get the distance from here, which I believe is 17 inches, but just to double check and be sure. Yeah, 17 inches. So closing measuring tool. 
and coming back to the 2D or the rod two, double clicking that dimension and making that, I'm not gonna make it 17, I'm gonna make it a little bit less. So I'm gonna go 16 and a half. The next thing is creating the dimension that we want to have here to be able to constrain that um, is the little handles that are protruding out beyond here. So that is like the distance from here to here. And we could say, I'm just going to guess at a number of two inches. And on this side, we don't need to have it uh, extending as far because uh, we're half inch material. It really doesn't have to be any more than maybe five eighths of an inch. So I'll go 0.625 and set that. At this point, we have a constrained uh, two dimensional sketch um, that moves around. We are good. I am going to now exit and finish this sketch and come in and use the press pull tool to bring that out by 0.5 of an inch. And 0.5 is the thickness of the material, that, the sheet material that we're going to be cutting this out of. So when we go to cut this, I am going to cut this from this angle top down around here to be able to get this angle in there. Uh, we are going to have a little bit of hand work to do uh, because I also want to have a hole that is located in the center of this flat spot here. And that hole is what's going to line up with the hole that is placed right here. So to be able to create a hole at that location, that is also going to be a sketch. So I'm going to use the sketch tool. And the first time I created a sketch, I selected the axis plane. Now this time I want to create a sketch on this face. So that kind of zooms in on that area right there. I'm going to use a draw circle. And I'm going to put in a circle that is a quarter of an inch. And that circle kind of floats around in there. Uh, not really what you want, it, although it will work if you're just quickly and not constraining, that, that's okay, um, but not, not okay. <laughs> Meaning it'll work, but not, not best practice to do so. So I'm going to constrain this circle uh, using a line, or better yet, a construction line. I'm going to snap to the center, to the midpoint and do the same thing on the opposite side. And one more constraint is going to be needed from here to midpoint. Now that line there is slightly at an angle. They, actually, they all are. Um, so it's still not centered, even though we're snapped to midpoints into the center. The circle itself is not centered within our main spot here. To be able to do that, I want to use the horizontal vertical constraint. Selecting here, we can see that that shifted to a vertical line. We now want to create a horizontal right there. So now we can see how those have turned black. Uh, they're fully constrained now. So if we try to click on here, we're going to get a message down here that's popping up that, hey, you know, we really can't do that because by having this constraint here and having midpoint to midpoint is automatically constraining this to be the same. Um, we don't have to dimension this in any way uh, with this being constrained in the midpoint here, which is locking center horizontally and then having these locked in to midpoint is setting that to be locked in vertically. So with that circle done and constrained, we'll click finish the sketch. I want to push pull this circle. And so far we've been using just distance. Uh, 
try to do that again. I selected the wrong object. So using the push pull, selecting that circle, and we can pull that through. This dimension could possibly change. Uh, so I don't want to give it a set dimension uh, because if we go to cut this and we realize that quarter inch is uh, not thick enough to support the weight of the rolling ball on top of it, we might need to go a little bit wider with that. And we don't have to ha want to worry about also changing the hold depth. So rather than the extent being a distance, I'm going to drop this box down and say to an object. And I want to have that object be the face of the opposite side of that hole. So we can see that it went straight through and it doesn't have a dimension here. It's just saying that we have to the object and it knows that what object and it remembers that. And the reason why that is important is if we need to come in and change the width of this bar in our history tree, we have our bodies, which is the main body here, which we don't do a whole lot with the bodies. It's mainly done with the sketches. We have two sketches. The one is the basic outline of our sketch. The other one is the sketch for that hole. So if we did need to make this a little bit bigger, we could just come in here and select that sketch, right click, and select edit sketch and make that change to whatever we want it to be. And the hold depth uh, would change and still be all the way through, even if we set this up to uh, three quarters of an inch. The hole that we have created is still going all the way through. So it automatically gets updated uh, since we had selected by choosing to go to a face or to an object rather than entering in a dimension. I'm going to come back in and make that change back to a quarter of an inch and finish this sketch. So again, we have our browser window here, which is listing all of the components that we have within the project or within our file. Then down below, we have kind of a timeline of operations that are being completed. So we have uh, what's listed right here is sketch one. This is the extrude of that sketch. This is the sketch two of that circle. Then that is the extrude of that circle. So if we wanted to edit this sketch, we don't necessarily have to come up here to this sketch and right click and edit. You could just come down here and edit the sketch from right here. It also sets the timeline and are able to like go back in time uh, by using the slider bar and selecting back. So that kind of grays out and you see our extruded hole is gone. It's, it still exists, uh, but from the time that we are, it's, it exists in the future. Um, so that is one way to start stay, staying a little bit organized. Um, we could always come back in and rename that um, operation on more complicated projects. Um, I will, um, and I do come in and rename those uh, because this timeline could stretch out if you have a part that has a lot of features, a lot of extrudes, holes, and um, cuts in them. Uh, it's nice to have these as named uh, items so you could easily recognize and come back and make the change that is needed. So I'm going to come in and click Save. And now we have a saved version or a new version of this, this rod. So coming back into our main assembly that we've started, and opening up our data pane, and here is the rod two. So bring that in. And now we want to be able to set a joint 
from the center of this circle to the center of that circle there. So we're going to take a look at how to do that one. So once it is uh, positioned, again, I'm not worried about how it's brought in, just wherever it is, it is, because we are going to be moving that. So again, simply coming up to joint. And we have those same type of points that we had earlier. And this time I want to go to this face right here, which is the center of that circle. That is going to be shaded out. Zooming in and around and kind of zooming in on this area here. And we want that. This is like the mating surface of where we want to have that. So let's click there. And well, almost there. Um, so it uh, came in upside down. That could be corrected by using a flip, which basically just flips that 180 degrees. To the point there. Now the next thing that we want to do is uh, set it to be what type of joint is this? Uh, so, so far we've worked with a rigid joint. Um, the, the motion that we had meaning rigid that it cannot move. Um, this is uh, going to revolve around that center point. So we're going to set that there and we can see that that kind of gives us a little animation of what that is doing and we'll say, okay, there. So now that we have that in place, that joint or that constraint is now centered on the circle that allows us to now add a little bit of motion to this and have this slide back and forth. Uh, the great thing about that is we're able to really come in and see if we have any coll collisions. Uh, is it going to work? Does it fit? Uh, did we measure and make this part correctly? So again, with the same timeline that we had and seen earlier, we have that listed here. Um, so we have, this is our joint that we just created right there. If we, you know, back that off one, we can see that that goes back to its original spot and moving that over, puts that back. So now we just want to insert a duplicate of that and place it uh, right here. So again, just dragging and dropping this in place. Say okay for that motion there. Rotate around and zoom in. I didn't have to position and rotate and zoom in. Originally, uh, I could have done that within the joint tool. I always like to kind of at least start within the right area. So again, I'm going to snap to that position right there. Zooming in. And again, so it is already set to the motion of what we had used the last. And again, it's rotated or flipped use the flip function and we are good. So we've now completed a, our constraints and have a completed fixed and filled in model. Now we have uh, a couple things that we could uh, do within here. Um, once this assembly is complete, this is for the you know, visualization of the completed model, make sure everything works and fits together and works together. Once it is completed, these files or individual components are still linked to the individual files. So if I wanted to make a change to this base uh, down here, coming, oh, double clicking that, we'll open this model up in a new space. or not, 
Um, not sure why it is not opening up. Let's try another version. No, the foot is open. Um, so let's just say we needed to make a change uh, to to this uh, the foot. Um, close the rod, and also close. Yeah, we're good. Try it one more time. No. All right. So if I needed to make the change uh, to actually, let's make the change to the the head up here. A couple reasons. Uh, things that I want to change is the height of this, I believe, is also a quarter of an inch, which matches exactly the quarter of an inch here. Um, so if in a perfect world that would you know slide uh, through there, but we need to add a little bit of, of a an allowance there. So I want to make this slot a little bit bigger. And that is on this head. So I will right click and open that up. And using the drop down here, we have a couple different sketches to figure out. You could hover your mouse over top of one of these sketches, which then highlights the sketch that that is on, which is right there. So right click and edit this sketch. And I already see the way I have it constrained is somewhat of an issue. Um, I have a quarter of an inch here, and I want to have this dimension really set to the midpoint of this line. So before I move anything, I'm going to delete that dimension. Let's see the best way to maybe do that. I don't know if we could dimension to a midpoint. Let's just give that a shot. It is not. So what we're going to do is draw a construction line from this point here to the midpoint over here. Now that is going to allow us to lock in and constrain the center point of that rectangle using the dimension tool. From this point to the top, which is right now at 5 eighths of an inch. We're going to lock that in place. So with that being set that way from the midpoint, when we change the value here, it is going to grow symmetrically about the center of that midpoint line. So if I increase that to three eighths of an inch, we can see it grew off of that center. So keeping that together is uh, going to be all right. That's a little bit too big uh, that I really want, but big enough to where we're going to be able to see the change. So I'm just going to click Save. When it saves, it also makes a update to our linked file. So if I come back over here, get a little triangle here, um, and it's saying that that component is out of date. Um, to zoom in and around so when I click the button to update this, we'll see the, uh, the effects. So along the top bar, I want to click the button to say get the latest. And that has been sort of updated. Now, see an issue here um, that it's not going all the way through. Um, and we also have a yellow uh, joint down here that's saying there's something wrong. Um, I'm going to come back over into the head to figure out what might be happening. Well, I'm back in time here. Um, so what is seeing, I'm still in the edit sketch, and I haven't finished the changes to this sketch. So the extrude that we are linked to and jointed to here really do not exist. Um, so coming over here, when we click finish sketch, we now have our finished sketch. Save this one more time. Coming back here, we also, again, it sees that it's changed. We get this little warning uh, that pops up. And when we click to get the latest, we will see that that is updated. And we can see we now have space above and below or that clearance space that is needed. So that is one way to update and make a change to a component to where it changes kind of globally. 
Now, if we had multiple assemblies that this part is being used, as you know, really do here. Um, so this was uh, the very first one that I made. This is the one that we were making. And we see that it's also saying, hey, things have changed. Let's update to the latest. So that is uh, one way to kind of keep all of your assemblies or all your different products kind of all linked together to where making a change to one part will make a change to all the parts or all the areas that that part is used. And that only happens if you keep the items linked to the main part within the assembly, because you can always right click and break that link. If I said at this point, okay, I know I only want to have that change or any changes to this part only happen within this assembly. If that part is used in any other assembly products that I designed and made, I don't want it to change there. I would have to break the link to be able to make the change to only that component. And that component, when that link is broken, still stays within the main model. It would not be a separate part listed out over here. We also have the ability to change parts within the assembly. Uh, this is uh, one that uh, the first time you uh, run this, you'll get a warning because this is a fairly new feature uh, that they have put in and they're just basically warning you that, hey, this is a new feature, it may be broken uh, or things don't completely work the way we want them to yet. Um, but anyway, uh, if we wanted to make a change to that base, you could come here and click edit and that's edit in place. So we'll capture the new position. And as we edit this, all the other components within our model kind of go to this ghosted uh, view. Uh, so that means that we really can't do anything to these areas here. One thing that we are able to do, and this is one of the reasons why I don't like to have um, components in here like this, if I always wanted to have, you know, this height being uh, bigger than that quarter inch, I can link in dimension off of, and constrain off of this dimension here, but that then creates a inner design constraint that could possibly cause issues if we ever decide that we want to replace this rod with a new part and then we lose that constraint. So that's one of the reasons why I don't like doing that. But anyway, getting back to, we are doing a in-place modification to a linked component. We have our sketches here and notice our timeline down below has also changed from the main assembly. So I'm gonna run this again, making notice of our timeline, going to end the edit in place. The timeline that we have listed here is the timeline for our main component list up here. Then when we click to edit in place, the timeline changes to only the timeline that makes up that component. So we could, you know, scroll through here if we could see that those holes are right there. Uh, if we wanted to change the depth of those holes, that is the extrude that created that. We could right click and edit, change that depth to be a minus 0.125, just reduce the depth there a little bit. And once we are done with that, we could click or uncheck that edit in place. And then when we save, that part is being saved. And also notice on the other version that we were working on, also became this little asterisk. And then we got this uh, yellow triangle saying that something has been updated and uh, you might wanna click uh, the button to get the latest. When we do that, we'll see that that value changes as well. So that is uh, kind of about it on the, uh, the assemblies. Uh, it is uh, tough to get used to it at first, 
uh, once you uh, get into it and play around with it, uh, hopefully it'll all make sense. Uh, the best way I think to start learning um, and how they interact with one another is start just a basic two-part model. And uh, I did that. Oh, I should have saved. I don't know why I've changed, but anyway. Um, coming here, just creating a basic, you know, two parts. So I, you know, created a model here that is just got a basic dado uh, through it, created another block. There's really nothing to it. And then I created a main document that pulls both of those together. Um, saying that one is updated, I must have changed something uh, prior to the last time I've opened that. So just update that to see what happens there because I had changed, uh, must have changed the material thickness on, on that part. Now's the time for questions. Yes, uh, so can Fusion drive a shop bot? Yes, uh, in, in an indirect way, just the same way that uh, VCarve Pro uh, drives uh, the ShopBot, where it is going to create the, the, the cutting file or the G code file, the ShopBot part file that we then open up in ShopBot 3. So, yes, you're able to create and make all of the, the tool paths, bit selections, uh, offsets, anything you need. Uh, right here in Fusion. And the one thing about uh, Fusion that we could do uh, that we really can't do easily in VCarve uh, Pro is we're able to select, even though we have our XYZ plane uh, set here, we're able to have a different structure or a different plane that we want to have work on. If you remember a couple weeks ago, we uh, talked about the uh, indexing of uh, you know three plus one machining or three plus two machining uh, we have that ability here in infusion yeah so i'll figure out uh, the best way i could share a link to this project um, to where everybody could uh, download it um, there, there's i haven't learned that yet i've not shared too many uh, projects only with just a, a couple uh, people that we know, but I'm certain there's a way I can make this uh, project uh, uh, public and shareable. So we can in, import uh, vector data into um, Fusion. Uh, that is, uh, again, going back to the tab view. And depending on what type of it is, uh, depending on how uh, you would want to import or export uh, that that file, so we can import, you know, off of your computer. And um, here are files that are listed. There's the, you know, DXF. They're not AI files and such aren't um, possible here. Uh, Three dimensional and um, STL and DXF files can be imported. Uh, but if you did have an AI or something that you wanted to have imported here, you could always open it and. VCarve Pro or Aspire and export that AI as a DXF, then be able to import it into uh, Fusion. That is going to be it uh, for today. Thank you for uh, joining us.